Good morning, traders. Welcome to Fed Day. Morning, Stell. Morning, Kate. Good morning. How's the uh, how are the bills there? Are they increasing rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yeah, don't stop going up. <laughs> oh man, crazy stuff. Crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll get into uh, the fun and games of uh, the UK inflation in a bit, and yeah. uh, what that means for the Bank of England. Um, oh, here he is. Okay, man, just uh, coming in. <laughs> just in okay. time. Hope you got a letter from uh, from your mum while you're late, Kay. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Am I late? Jesus. <laughs> you know, yeah, what we've already talked to all the headlines. Important persons are always a little late, right? <laughs> you uh, were late uh, 35 whole seconds. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Not, not that we're counting, but... Uh... <laughs> What's my punishment? Um, you get to cover the Bank of England tomorrow. Uh, oh no! Yeah, well, yeah, okay. There's no Bailey Presser. I'll, I'll, I'll do the Bank of England. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! Uh, I, should have, I should have made it the May one. Anyway, yeah. right. Let's uh, let's crack on. Um, so, mate, that puts sorry, mate? the FOMC in power. What's what? Sorry. Since I'm I'm taking the Bank of England tomorrow, you you cover uh, FOMC and Powell tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to, I didn't yeah. think that was going to change anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to put my feet up and let him waffle on. I think this time, everyone everyone's got the video. Um, <laughs> anyway, lots to talk about. Obviously, Powell, Bank of England, um, everything going on today. So we'll crack through the headlines. Um, uh, Japanese Cabinet Secretary Matsuno confirmed that they will be allocating more than 2 trillion yen from reserves for measures to cushion the blow to the economy from rising prices. Um, so how are they going to do that? Probably along the same lines of energy subsidies and the like going forward. So more fiscal measures from Japan that the BOJ have to worry about. Um, the government also maintained its monthly economic assessment for March. Um, there was a cut on the assessment of production. Um, they see corporate uh, profits, sees the economy picking up moderately, but sees some weakness. Um, so they cut the assessment of production and corporate profits and sees the economy picking up moderately, but with some weakness. Um, ECB's NREA said that higher interest rates require banks to sharpen focus on liquidity and seize the risk that banks might be caught off guard. Um, if they're caught off guard two weeks after or a week or so after this is all kicked off, then they deserve to get a spank, in my opinion. Um, no one should be getting caught off guard now that uh, we know what the issues are. Um, Bundesbank... Nagel, the chief there, says that rate setters must be more stubborn in the inflation fight. He's going full tilt uh, still on policy. He says, our fight against inflation is not over. Uh, we should do more on cutting back APP repurchases and at a later stage should consider slowing PEPP repurchases. So he wants to uh, QT to increase there. Um, ECB's Lane says inflation falling predicated on wage growth peaking this year. Um, they keep telling us that there's not a wage spiral, but they want to see wages peaking anyway. Um, ECB's Lagarde, uh, I think she's on a hat trick of uh, speaking this week. She's spoken every day so far. Um, and she's come out with this, gem: We are neither committed to raise rates further, nor are we finished with raising rates. So, so they might raise, they might not raise, or they might cut, or any combination of the above. Yeah, yeah. they may not <laughs> raise, but they probably will raise. But they might not raise, and if they raise, they might not. Yeah, and then, uh, and then the other gem was uh, that they <laughs> they need a robust strategy. I was even surprised she could spell the word strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I. We are blessed with the central bankers we have now. Uh, we, we could we could say, as I said in the room, I say, where did where did we deserve Bailey, Lagarde, etc.? We must have done something really wrong in the form of former life. But it's actually a blessing in these guys, right? I mean, gives us something to talk about, laugh about. That's a good point, yeah. actually. Yeah, I yeah. mean, 
And actually, now... And sometimes gives us a trade. Exactly, Ryan. Exactly. I was just going to say exactly the same. At least when uh, when we get their uh, randomness and everything, it gives us trades. Yeah. Mike says uh, Lagarde is playing both sides. I don't think she knows what side she's on right now. <laughs> uh, so I, don't know, I don't know about playing both of them. You know, we know she's been hawkish, and I still think she's been given a bit of a, a slap by some for pre-committing to those 50 pip hikes. Um, and she's had to dial back on that, most definitely. But uh, that comment, you know, neither committed or are we finished with hiking. It's just uh, clarity for no one. Um, anyway, let's move away from the ECB on to uh, the next bunch of clowns. Um, <laughs> and uh, that is Sunak and Brexit, because now some of his Eurosceptic Euro skeptic conservative MPs um, say that's the Stormont break in the Windsor framework. This is this Brexit deal on Northern Ireland is practically useless. And Boris Johnson has come out saying he's likely to vote against the Brexit deal. Um, now, this uh, Euro skeptic conservative group is the ERG, which some of you may remember from the prior Brexit mess. Um, so basically, Sunak and the vote is today in Parliament. He faces um, a few more people against the deal. Um, whether it's enough to stop this vote passing is another matter. I don't think the numbers are there to stop it, but depends on what uh, the opposition does as well, of course. Um, but we've still not at the end of this road yet. <sighs> one day, one day. CPI in the UK. And uh, if you Look at any UK press, CPI unexpectedly, surprisingly, shockingly went up. And uh, you may know if you've been watching the Flow Show for a long while, it's not unsurprising to those of us sitting here. Um, so CPI year on year was expected to drop to 9.9%, came in higher than that and higher than last month. Uh, the core number as well also coming in higher than expected and higher than last month. Um, so, so much for the BOE potentially going into pause and some talking about rate cuts. Um, very strong numbers from the UK, um, though there was a little bit of relief, depending on uh, how you want to pick it. PPI uh, came in a bit softer on the output measure, also came in a bit softer on the input measure. Um, now, we look at input and output as in the, the prices firms have to pay for their goods or their, their manufacturing items, if you like. Um, and then there's the output price, which is what firms charge to their customers for the stuff they've made. Um, so it's a bit of a, a margin trade, if you like. Um, they're both still going up, but they're both still easing. Input prices slightly higher than output prices. Um, so that's a, a tiny bit of a margin squeeze for firms. Um, retail prices uh, came in much higher on the core as well. Um, came in much higher on the headline as well. So this is a retail price index. As we know, grocery prices are running at record highs still. So long and short, no inflation let up for the UK. Um, something, as you know, I've been saying for ages, inflation is going to be far more stickier in the UK than anywhere else. And the central bank is far more useless at being able to contain inflation than anywhere else, mainly due to the nature of inflation. A lot of it is coming from abroad, imported energy, food and the like. So it's not inflation that the Bank of England really has a lot of control over with interest rates. They could hike to 10 percent interest rates. They could keep interest rates at 2 percent. It would have very little difference. The difference it does make is how the economy reacts to high rates, and that is how inflation is is maybe addressed. Um, that's what every other central bank is trying to do, um, but it's going to be a tough task for the Bank of England to do it. Um, what that means is that a 25 pip hike has now turned into a 98.4% probability uh, earlier this week, unchanged was a 55% probability and a 25 pip hike was a 44% probability. So that's completely flipped around. Um, what happens tomorrow at the Bank of England is 
could be defining. Um, we know they've been edging towards pausing or not going as high as the market expects. Um, I think still they will be forced much higher. So it, it now stands as to whether we get a bit more of a hawkish Bank of England tomorrow based on these inflation numbers. Um, what's going to be interesting also is the vote numbers, how they drop tomorrow, because that's one thing that can swing the initial um, moves in the pound as to how many people are voting for hikes or the decision, how many people are going to vote leaving rates unchanged. Maybe even some have been talking about cuts. Um, the last vote was seven to two for a hike, um, with seven voting for a hike, two to keep uh, rates unchanged. We're expecting a six and three split um, tomorrow, six voting for hikes, three for unchanged. Um, so anything higher than that, i.e. seven, eight voting for hikes, would be looking a bit more hawkish um, on that front. Guys, what do you think of it? Still, inflation in the UK? Yeah, I mean, inflation, we've talked about inflation in different parts of the world. So the UK is just like a Eurozone is a lot more dependent on energy ex externally, right? So as as the price of energy stays high, uh, inflation stays sticky. And uh, yes, I know that oil has been dropping over the past couple of weeks, but this is a very um, recent move. You know, the, um, the past few months have been uh, uh, characterized by uh, high prices of energy. And it takes energy to create everything. So inflation is sticky. We're seeing this in the UK. I find it very, very difficult to see how they cannot hike, um, even with the um, the banking troubles. Now, I know I've said in the past that I think you know, um, given the the uncertainty in the in the banking sector, um, this might push central banks to be more cautious. But you know, for the last few days, it seems that. Uh, the central banks and lawmakers, they want to um, do everything they can, use every tool that they have, and they've already started doing that, to contain the um, uh, the, the panic. And uh, as you guys have said repeatedly and very correctly, um, uh, it's a different thing uh, between monetary policy and uh, using tools to protect the banks. So theoretically, <clears throat> excuse me, with the inflation now ticking back up again in the UK, I find it very difficult to see any arguments for not hiking 25. And I mean, it's not like a hike is going to make a difference in the um, in the uh, in the banking situation. It's more more a, a move of confidence. Uh, but at the moment, given that things are seemingly contained, I think. Uh, uh, the market pricing 98% chance or whatever that is of a 25 hike is uh, is is fair. I mean, I don't know what you guys think, but I see yeah. I see very little reason for uh, at least a majority. Uh, for, I see a very little reason for for a majority to to vote for a, for a no change. Maybe we'll get a, one or two dissenters again. You know, you're always going to get the doves who are going to find a, 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 a an excuse to be yeah. uh, dovish. Uh, but uh, overall, I think the Bank of England will hike um, uh, because inflation is still out of hand. Yeah. What do you think, Kay? Does this does this maybe have them taking a bit more of a hawkish slant tomorrow? Or uh, I, I guess uh, they have to on inflation, and somewhere they are also um, supported by the latest data. Uh, and I keep repeating myself in, in in many countries, not really falling out of bed yet. Actually, if you look at it um, on, on the face of things, the, the, the latest round of numbers was worse in the US than, than they were in um, Europe or, uh, or the UK, for instance, if you take them as a whole, right? Um, yeah. You have the, the, the occasional outliner there. But so, um, no, I think they, they, they have reasons to be, to be hawkish. Now, we know Bailey and, uh, and, and his lot um, and, and those doves also uh, in there. Um, it's going to take uh, a, a very hawkish man, I think, to, to keep the Bank of England on a, on a, in, in an extreme, or not extreme, but in a real hawkish uh, um, scenario. But they, they can't do otherwise, right? Um, yeah, I think 25 is... is I've, I've always thought that they... That they should hike anyway, but um, I think it's the the data also are are, are supportive for it. Uh, we haven't seen really real bad data. Okay, we have like 
those those um, lending numbers and stuff, the credit credit numbers were were not great, but it's about the same everywhere. So um, no, I think they have they have every reason to be um, to be hawkish tomorrow uh, on on the Bank of England. Um, and and regarding um, as Stelios uh, just said, and we have been saying here repeatedly. Um, that it's a different thing between uh, monetary policy, the sheer move of interest rates, and then what they do on the sides. We have seen, for instance, in um, in the States, the, the Fed has injected uh, a massive amount of liquidity, and then the rest is over to the Treasury, right? Um, yeah. So in, in that for the FOMC tonight is keeping me also on the, um, on the hiking uh, side of things. They probably will do 25. There's, there's not really a reason, because the numbers have been coming off a little bit, barring uh, the the last big domino, which is the uh, employment report. Um, is, is They've been coming off a little bit, so that will keep them really away from the 50 already. That is a good enough reason. Um, and uh, But on the other side, I mean, there's only as much as they can do uh, for the... Um, for the banking sector as well. Um, and let's face it, we, we are not in a 2008 situation as we have already said so many times, um, whether it is in the States, whether it is over here with the, with the Credit Suisse. Uh, Credit Suisse was potentially a much bigger, much, much bigger piece uh, than, uh, than the um, American regional banks, in, in, in my opinion, um, of, because they, they are or were a, a systemic important bank. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to the FOMC, the the um, I don't see them uh, um, near hand still. It, there's there's no reason, you know, and and, and inflation is still uh, way higher than they think. The jobs the jobs are keeping up, and the rest of the 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 numbers have been volatile. Although, as I said, a bit weakening, so that will keep them for sure away from the 50 BPs this time as well. Yeah. Um, well, just looking at uh, some of that other data um, from yesterday as well, um, Canada CPI um, came in, uh, it's following the same direction, coming in lower, uh, core coming down, headline coming down, um, much sharper than expected. So for the Bank of Canada, that keeps them firmly on pause, um, no reasons there for them to change uh, policy. Um, it's just going to be, I think, a question of whether the data starts to diverge between different countries. You know, we've already seen inflation up in some Eurozone countries, um, you know, Spain, France, uh, Germany uh, as well. And now we're seeing it in the UK, US. We had that uh, little bit of a hot P, uh, PCE report, the core PCE number, but inflation still coming down, although the core's coming up. It's all becoming a little bit messy in, in the inflation world. Um so that's that's to be expected going forward as well. Um, but it is it is a bit of a divergence, particularly in the US. We've got the Philly Fed um, non-manufacturing index. That's basically services. Um, that came in at minus 12.8 versus 3.2 prior. Um, this one, I don't know why it's not put on any calendars. Um, so I'd have to read out the numbers. Um, new orders was a negative, minus 15.4 versus plus 6.2 prior. Employment, 3.2 versus 15.9 prior. Uh, the wages and benefits cost index, 25.1 versus 44.2 prior. So we know manufacturing had been a little bit lagging or a little bit sloppy the last few months from the PMIs. Um, we know the Empire and Philly Fed manufacturing were poor numbers. Now this is a services number that's turned around the other way. And you may remember we got strong services numbers in the PMIs and ISMs last month. Um, so the question is, was that a little bit of a new year pickup and it's coming out, falling out of bed this time or not? We won't find out until Friday when we get the uh, first round of flash PMI numbers. Maybe that will shed some light. So particularly for the US, be careful with that, depending on what the Fed do. If the Fed are a, a bit hawkish and the market fancy some dollars friday we get a poor pmi number that's going to flip those rate expectations once again and uh good for trading good volatility but you've got to be prepared to go both ways on this um and just to highlight the, the data divergence yet again housing existing home sales are strong up that broke a 12 month i think 12 11 12 month streak 
of falling numbers. Um, and we saw from starts and permits uh, earlier this week were strong as well. So the housing market doing OK. So they, as I say, there's a lot of divergence coming into the data, particularly for the US. Um, and we need to see if that happens in, in other sides because it becomes a game of what data matters more than others. For the UK, services matter more than um, manufacturing. For the US, it's a bit more 50-50, likewise to other countries. So for the Fed coming up, um, I still think they go the 25. Um, I still think they stay, they say they're going to stick to their path of getting inflation under control, um, whether they ease up on the language that we heard from Powell um, not a week or so ago, his uh, testimonies uh, that rates might uh, have to go higher than expected. Also, we've had those hawkish Fed members, quite a few of them saying that the dots are, or they're going to be moving their dots higher, so a higher rate ceiling. We're going to be, that's going to be the judgment tonight. The hike size is one thing where the expected path of rates are going is the next. If they're not as high as what Powell and the others have led us to believe because of these worries in the US, that's going to be taken negatively. Um, overall, for, for the dollar, um, obviously, we keep an eye on yields. Um, they're going to tell us what we need to do. Whatever happens, I can't see, and I've been saying it for the last few weeks, I can't see the Fed or expectations getting back up to some of these highs we've seen in things like yields and the dollar. I just can't see it happening. Um, there's too much going on, too much uncertainty coming into the data. Um, so I think that any rally we get in the dollar today will evaporate fairly quickly. Um, and the market is going to be sticking with a bone that the Fed, they may take rates up, but they're not going to be able to keep them up there for long. And then they're going to be coming down uh, quickly. Um, Stel, what are your thoughts on, on the Fed? Well, um, I was saying uh, last week that, uh, you know, with this whole situation with the banking uh, uncertainty, Credit Suisse, I, I was saying that I think there is increasing chance of the Fed um, playing defense and basically uh, not hiking. Uh, I think that with the way things have gone this week and um, with the measures that have been taken and basically with the way they have protected the, uh, the, the confidence in the system, I think now it's all clear for them to go 25. Um, and I think they probably will today. And that's what the market's pricing, pretty much, I think, 80% chance, 85% chance. Um, if they don't go 25, that means that there are serious problems which we don't know of. Um, the big question is, what will they say? Because I think 25 is a given. Uh, it, you know, it, it, it could be that um, Powell just comes out, you know, they hike 25 and he says, look, uh, inflation is still high. We need to keep hiking. Uh, maybe at the same pace. They did 25 last time, right? They're going to do 25 this time. They can keep going at 25s until inflation comes lower, um, which it is coming lower, but uh, until inflation comes to their target or close to. Uh, so he could say, look, we're doing 25. Uh, the market is very well supported by, you know, swap lines, uh, guarantees, deposits, all that. We're going to keep um, going ahead with our plan which is to control inflation. So there is a, a probability that this, it's a possibility that this will happen. If that happens, I think then risk gets sold uh, because that means that they're not close to, to stopping. Cut still uh, this year. So I think this is the main risk now that they hike 25 and that they are hawkish, uh, at least not dovish, let's, let's put it that way. So, um, what do I think they're going to do? I think I think Powell, given the whole uncertainty and given the fact that I don't personally know how how big the extent of the you know the damage in the banking uh, industry is, I think he's probably going to do 25 and be relatively neutral uh, on the uh, on the meeting. And you know what? There's no point in taking a risk being either too dovish or too hawkish, right? There's still too many too many uncertainties out there. So I think. Uh, 25 neutral, and uh, it could be a bit of a non-event, unfortunately. Oh, after, all non -event? The, after all that's happened this, this week, it could become a non-event, really. I, I, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's going to be a fairly choppy one, whatever they do, because like you say, there's still a lot in the market who are uncertain. I mean, Ellie's made the point, why are Goldman Sachs saying no hike this week um, when others are saying 25 pips? Well, we've still got Nimura saying that they're going to cut rates um, by 25 pips, so 
you know, that tells you something about bank uh, bank forecasts. They change yeah. like the weather, and uh, you know, they're also there for a bit of uh, clickbaitery. Um, but yeah, it's this is one of those. It's like the ECB. You know, I said the ECB were going to go to fifty, and they went to fifty because they've got to they've got to continue with their fight for inflation, and they've got to separate that from financial stability um, because as I've repeated, they built these tools up over the last 10, 15 years to cope with these problems. There's no point having to use monetary policy to cope with these problems because that's admitting that your tools that you've just built over the last 15 years aren't up to the task. Um, so they've got to they've got to keep that separate. But as Stel says, there is a risk that if there's stuff that they know about that we don't, that there's bigger problems, then if they do that through monetary policy, um, that's going to create big waves in the market because uh, the market will, to put it bluntly, shit the bed. Um, that's a that's a technical trading. A technical. <laughs> we use on the we use on the trading desks of old. <laughs> but, uh, so, Kate, you're in the same boat, I think. Um, you know, do they keep the policies separate and talk yeah, about um, the, the financial risks separately yeah. to what they're going to do on inflation? Yeah, completely. They they. They're, as I said, they're supported by the by the employment report, right, uh, and and the inflation. Um, the rest can be a bit brushed under the carpet as vol as volatile data. Um, so yeah, base case is twenty five. The, the um, I don't think they can even envisage to do fifty, but that would be like a bit of a shocker. Um, but I think this. And, and Powell, as we know, is used now to, to walk a very fine line, which he, um, regardless how policy is um, perceived, the, the, the way that he walks fine lines is, uh, is pretty, um, pretty spectacular. Uh, I must say, uh, uh, me having been 40 years in the market and seen a lot of central bankers, um, he's one of those who is uh, very, very able to, to, to walk the uh, high wire lines, you know. Um, the one thing that he may say, he, he, he will have to comment at one stage, and that's going to be for the presser, what they did um, with those liquidity injections, because it's, it reduced uh, the effect of QT that they have done so far by, by half. And there may be a bit of a, a, um, a kicker in, in there um, of, of how the market perceives, uh, because that that is talking about the liquidity in the market, right? And and if you add liquidity in the market, that's going to be perceived positively by uh, by by asset markets. If you if you take away liquidity, then it's going to be perceived negatively. And I think it may have a bigger impact than just doing the twenty five or so. The, the the rate hike will send one message, and I think the liquidity stuff will be, and and that's where. Um, I joined the, the still uh, comments. It's it's about the same also as saying we don't know whether some that bodies still have to fall out of the uh, out of the cupboard, or we we know that it's not that um, that severe, and then we, yeah. we we pick up the QT again. And I think there will be, for me at least, uh, a big message in uh, in in what uh, he may say. Uh, all thing all else uh, equal, of course. Yeah. So do, do you think the Hawks have perhaps had a bit of a, a wake up call? You know, uh, they were talking the Arch Hawks, been... like the Kashkaris and the Bullards. Do you think they may not uh, be looking as high for the rate ceiling now? We, we'll hear about that afterwards because they were. <laughs> the, the, the thing is that it, the, the, the whole, uh, saga, the whole uh, story happened when they, when they just entered uh, their quiet period, right? Yeah. And uh, so we so we don't really know <laughs> we don't really know what they are thinking right now. I think that that may be uh, where your dot plots come into play, right? They yeah. they may express their feelings and 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 then afterwards we will hear uh, traditionally about all of them. Uh, but there they may they may express what they think uh, through the the dots. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's yeah. Uh, yeah. go, mate. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know we're already on the FOMC, but I, I would just perhaps when I take the screen or so, um, um, give a couple of comments about what happened. Uh, uh, the thing in Japan you talked about, the stimulus package, and then uh, the Xi uh, Putin meeting. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'm going to uh, just jump onto that. Got some last lines to do, okay, then we'll get good. really stuck into the prices. 
Um, so staying in the US and Treasury Sec Yellen said there will be time to evaluate whether bank regulatory adjustments will be needed to address root causes of the current crisis. Um, the Fed's going to be in the firing line for that because they had supervision of SVP, uh, SVB, um, <clears throat> as we mentioned this week. Um, and questions are being asked there on why they didn't take a stronger arm. They flagged some of these problems, including the, the, the interest rate risk. Um, but the bank apparently did nothing. So there's going to be questions over why they didn't push harder uh, to get, keep that contained. Um, on the uh, Russia-China stuff, um, there's been a whole mix of stuff going on. Um, China and Russia have agreed to further energy cooperation. Um, Putin said he's going to boost LNG supplies to China and oil as well. Um, also, they're going to extend pledged oil cuts through June. Um, that's to everyone else. Um, various areas reported that uh, Putin and Z paid great attention to the Ukraine peace plan in the one-on-one -on -one meeting, um, but not a lot came out of that uh, in terms of what may happen from that. Um, while they were talking about peace, um, Russian Defence Minister said fewer and fewer steps are left towards a nuclear collision um, and Russia will respond to possible depleted uranium ammo supplies to Ukraine by Britain. Um, in a joint statement um, between Russia and China, they said that Russia-China relations do not constitute a military political alliance. Um, so overall, not really a lot came from it. Nothing that signals any steps towards any solution in Ukraine or China pushing you, uh, Russia to, to get to the negotiating table. Um, it was all a bit of backslapping how great relations are and how they're going to do much more business together. Um, what do you guys make of uh, what came out of that in the end? Well, I think it was worrying. Um, uh, unless, unless we get a, a quick... Now, a fast call from G to Ukraine, what he, what he said he may be doing, uh, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Unless we get that, and, and there's there's real talks coming uh, coming out of there, right? I, I don't, it was extremely underwhelming on the peace side, in my opinion. Um, I, I didn't see personally anything um, that is going to stop Putin from, uh, from continuing. Um, but yeah. we, they will never tell us uh, uh, officially or openly if, if China is going to support Russia with, our, with, with weapons and stuff. But um, behind the scenes, um, it, it's, uh, I think it's a worry. Um, I, I'm, I, I didn't hear anything uh, really positive coming out of that meeting. Yeah, Stel, you got any thoughts on uh, all that stuff? Yeah, it, it worries me a little bit. Um... I have to agree with Kay. You know, it's um, you know they were they were both talking about how the majority of the um, transactions between the two countries are now being done in uh, yuan and rubles, and you know the collaboration is strong and this and that. So basically, they have a common enemy, which is the U.S. And uh, I don't like it when the world kind of reduces itself to uh, you know two 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 sides. Uh, especially yeah. if there's lots of power on both of them. Uh, you know, it used to be US versus Russia. Now, you know, Russia-China is a very, very powerful combination. So I, it, it scares me a little bit. I don't know, you know, market-wise, what are the implications? Well, none yet, but, you know, things like that brewing uh, can't be good. Yeah, I think the market's got a case of uh, fingers in its ears um, over this. Yeah, I mean, what about these equities, man? I mean, seriously. They're re amazing resilient. I, I'm I'm clapping. I'm like, yeah, well done. You know, it's fantastic. <laughs> but how? You know, why? <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I don't know is the answer. Yeah, we've we've been a bit uh, confused about some of these moves. Um, you know, we th we thought maybe okay, we're saying that you know perhaps some of the bid in the euro is expectation for the 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 Z. Putin meeting and maybe some resolution that hasn't really happened and yet euro still holding up um so is is it just uh undoing of some of some trades that we've had this week risk trades into the mm. fomc are we going to just shuffle the deck uh, after mm. get back to dollar being strong who knows um this is a tough part of trading um you know you've just got to 
as we've been saying all week. You've got to stay nimble. You've got to go with the flow, go with the punches. Don't get married to a side or a bias at the moment um, because all it takes one headline and everything turns around. Um, so for me, coming into this one, um, I do have a bit of a, a bit of an idea for cable, um, purely based on what's happened with the CPI report. Um, I was hoping maybe that we might get a move up to to one twenty four over that CPI and and just everything going on. Not looking the case at the moment. Uh, my thought was that this might be a good one to short into over the FOMC um, because if the Fed do come out and hike twenty five and stick to their plan, you're going to see the dollar bid up a bit that will cause a dip in cable um if you get a decent move in that to, uh, you know a couple hundred pips then that may be something to look at flip into a a long post fomc to run into the bank of england if they come out with something that's a bit more hawkish um plus i still think that the dollar any dollar strength we see is going to go pretty quickly evaporate qu pretty quickly so that's going to be another um tailwind for something like cable um, but you can cast your net across a lot of dollar pairs at the moment. Um, you know, euro dollar still knocking up against or just below that 108 level. Um, it's found a bit of a brick wall in the 80s yesterday. It's struggling to really get close to, to 108. Maybe the market's pushed itself enough over the last day or so. Um, it doesn't want to go out on a limb now. I wouldn't rule out a move above 108. Uh, before the FOMC, just if the pressure bears fruit and we get a little bit of a stop blow through. Um, but I'll be careful that it quickly reverses and we sort of revert to mean and hover around this 108 area. Um, I'm still long in this one. I'm looking. I've just got my finger hovering over the trading button now because I want to take a bit more off into 108 if I see it, uh, bring my stop up a bit more and lock in what I've got. Um, what are you guys thinking trading wise for this one? Um, dollar yen's creeping up again, uh, but I, I can't help but think this is still a, a rally sell. Kay, do you think? Uh, euro crosses, mate. I, I think a lot has to do with the euro crosses. Um, uh, yesterday we have seen that hundred points rally in the euro sterling. Okay, today it's been uh, it's been undone for half on that on that CPI. But then euro yen bid, euro Canada bid, euro Aussie still bid on dips. Um, I, I, I think it's a, a lot of it is is euro and then uh in addition is again the japanese stimulus package right they 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 will continue and 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 i think that's one of the factors to me at least personally is uh is is why yen is is yen can strengthen on stress elsewhere on expectations for ueda or whatever but then if you look at uh, behind the scenes what's going on i i think yen is it's tough for, for to buy yen for more than a few sessions uh, at the time. Well, that, that's me at least because of those stimulus packages. Uh, Ueda already said and Kishida that they will work closely together. Um, yeah, and, and and yeah, that's my my view on the yen is is long term still unchanged. I long term I'd rather be short yen than long uh, long the the Japanese uh, currency. It's yeah. Kay, did you say it's it's difficult to buy yen for more than a few sessions or seconds? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bye. Okay. <laughs> I, I, sex sessions or seconds? Seconds Sessions. more like. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry, my, my English sucks. <laughs> I know the feeling. It, it is times like that. I mean, you had a trade in that mix that was almost like seconds. Um, so yeah, it just that proves the point. You you, you yeah. don't want to stay in stuff for too long. Um, Ali wants to look at gold. Um, I'm not trading it personally at the moment, um, but it has weakened off. I still think a lot of this move was the bank panic and, you know, players like hedge funds moving into something that's a bit safer than uh, everything else. Um, you know, you've got, you've got two bottom lines of safety, if you like. If you're not going into treasuries, um, you're going into gold and that's the next step from just going into cash and sitting on your sitting on your mattress full of cash. Um, so I think that was a big move up there. And I'm not surprised to see it come off because now, you know, the bank situation is seemingly easing. Um, so that's why gold has, has come off, but it, it hasn't come off, uh, you know, as much as it's gone up in the last few days. So 
yeah, keep an eye on that one. Maybe something to do with what, what happens in the dollar. Gold's always a, a mover on the dollar. Um, but like Stell says, you know, stocks are, are holding up relatively well. Um, you know, just looking at the S&P back in the 4,000s, um, you know, it's trading nicely between the big figures. You know, a lot of people had eyes on that uh, 38 handle. Off it went. Um, so now what we're going to be looking at, getting up towards that 41 area, perhaps. Um, that's where we had re resistance before, a bit of an old area. And then up towards the 42 that everyone was looking at before. So, you know, you've got these decent ranges and this is a sort of, these are the sorts of levels you want to look at over these events. OK, you can mess around in the middle here, trading in and out between 4,000, 3,900, whatever you want to do. Um, but keep an eye on the wider picture. Know where your bigger levels are, because um, they're the ones that are really going to stand out. You know, you, we can flip flop around here. People can make plenty of money doing that. But if you want to get in these big, strong moves, look for the big levels and you don't have to put a lot of risk into them. We get up to, to you know, 40, 70s, 40, 80s. You can have a trade. If it breaks through 41, well, you know, you're probably heading higher. So, you know, 20, 30 pips risk is all you need on that. Um, same up here. You can trade the 42 with maybe 20 pips of risk. And, uh, you know, if it stays in range, well, then you can sit in a nice short, maybe all the way down to the lows again. Um, so the same exercise I do for these big events with it's data, central banks, whatever, is I go over the charts, I look at my levels, I might have four or five levels, and then I whittle them down. I say, right, well, I've got these four or five levels, but these are the ones I really want to concentrate on. You know, being picky about cable, it's 124 or 120. Yeah, we may not get there, but those are the levels. If we get there, they're the ones I'm really going to be interested in trading. Um, and I do that with, with all the pairs. So, you know, have a look. Dollar CAD, 138 and these highs is a consideration. 135s is a consideration on the downside. And if the Fed is volatile enough, you may get some of those levels. Um, so always have them at the back of your, your mind, the ones you want to look at. Uh, Kate, time to do your tour. Jawohl. Um, what am I going to do first? All oh, right, yeah. let's do, um, I'm, I'm not using doing these very often. I'm going to have a look at the euro dollar. Because I think there's a bit of an interesting, uh, interesting zone here. Um, we've been in this kind of uh, setup and uh, and doing higher highs. I think the the interesting zone is right here. Um, it's it's just above 108 uh, that everybody's uh, looking at, and then we have the 38.2 showing up here again uh, around 108 and a quarter. That's the, that's my zone here, my initial zone on the top side, 108, 10, 25. And on the downside, okay, we have a little bit already at 107 and a quarter, I'd say. And then uh, the bigger one is going to be around 106.80. Um, I have similar view. I think the euro for the time being is attracting some decent, uh, decent flows. If you look at the crosses, um, if anything, if we see like an initial blip um, on the dollar higher, that would uh, take the euro back into low uh, 107s, high 106s. I'm going to be tempted to counter trade this just because of the current strength of uh, of the euro. Um, we've seen that the European uh, banks have very little exposure to what's happening in uh, in Switzerland. So I'm uh, tempted to think, as I've already said, that uh, that Swiss story is, even though it could have been a, a, a big one, seems to be for the time being contained to Switzerland, but uh, we we cannot um, we cannot judge about any final implications before we 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 know, of course. But in current context, I think any move back down to 107 or below uh, is going to find buyers on uh, on the euro dollar. Um, yeah, your cable, you've already done it. I can live with that uh, range that you you put up there. 120, 124 looks uh, looks pretty good to me. Um, it's been rejected many, many times above, so four, four and a half, and then uh, on the downside. But I, I don't think in, it's it's far away right now. Um, I'd say we already get bits even somewhere between one twenty two and uh, one twenty one sixty uh, in the current uh, environment. I'd say. Um, 
So, yeah, so overall, I'm, I mean, it's selective. Um, I'm, I'd rather buy euros and sterling than some than something else, for instance, uh, because those are the two who, in my opinion, hold uh, hold uh, pretty well. The dollar yen is a different animal, a very, very different animal to me. Um, let's go on to the daily. And there's only, to me, one level to watch today on the close, and that's here, 132.70. Whether you're above or below, I think that's going to be decisive for the um, for the next uh, sessions. Um, if we are below, then uh, we have to look at what's going on again somewhere in those low one thirty ones, because then there, there, there's a risk for uh, this story and rally to to completely uh, um, reverse. But if we're above, then I wouldn't be surprised if we are if if we start to move back up to high 133s and why not uh, back up to closer where the prior top was just uh, ahead of uh, 135. That's just for the dollar yen. I am rather watching those those yen crosses and there's there's two that really caught my eye today and that's this euro euro yen again. It's back above this 142.70 143 the, the, the figure zone. It's 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 really very big, uh, and uh, I think that has to do with um, what, I, what we talked about, about those Japanese uh, stimulus packages uh, as, as well. Um, there is some risk, though, uh, popping up again. I just saw that Gaff posted a, um, an article saying that uh, Russia is moving some of its uh, war material back to the Kuril Islands, which is uh, a disputed island group with Japan, so we have to keep an eye on that uh, as well. But um, in any case, um, this one looks very big to me. Any move lower to low 142s, mid 141s, unless there are uh, big accidents again on the, on the risk front, uh, I think he's going to to find buyers um, again. That's my bias anyway. Um, and uh, another one that I'm looking at is this sterling yen. And you can see we back above uh, back above the wedge. Um, tried it um, last night, uh, and and we started to move up again, again there. We are in an interesting zone here, though. One sixty three twenty up to one sixty three eighty, and you find it also back here, um, and here is is going to be a zone uh, worth monitoring, and um, that is something to watch. And I like to watch um, those crosses when. It's very uncertain on the dollar. Those might be uh, uh, different things to do. And then depending on what happens before the FOMC, like for instance, uh, right now, those, those yen crosses are bought um, and the euro crosses are bought and the sterling crosses are, uh, are, are bought. Those are interesting things to watch depending on what happens uh, with, with risk pairs. And um, I always like to keep a, a close eye on uh, what's happening in the crosses. Um, and then emerging markets. This one, dollar mix. It's um, it's it's really rejected very strongly above uh, above nineteen. And um, I've commented briefly on it um, in the in the room this morning, uh, where we are now. I think the, this it's a bit unclear here, but there's still a big zone here in the, in in the low eighteen forties on the dollar mix. I think mix could do well on a neutral to mildly positive. Um, FOMC today, the MEX could continue to, to do well. Where the MEX could have trouble today is the two extremes. Either a, a very hawkish that would, would send the dollar higher or a panically dovish one which would single, signal that the Fed is worried about the banking system and that will not be good for emerging markets um, um, regardless how we take any, any dollar move. So the extremes are going to be a, a little worse for the mix than, than what a middle path to uh, mildly positive path would be. Then I think dollar mix uh, could, could really put this uh, 1840 under, under pressure and perhaps start to take uh, its way lower again in, in stuff like uh, Euro mix. But Euro mix, I'm a little uh, um, hesitant right now because I'm, I've got this this pretty bullish feeling on the on the euro process. Um, kill my squawk. 
Um, another one that I'm uh, watching, and that after this meeting with uh, with G and and Putin, I'm, as I said, I was really disappointed by uh, by the meeting. Even though uh, people can say like, oh, what what could we have expected? Well, I mean, China wants to be seen as a little bit of the peacemaker right now, and uh, but they really failed there, I think. So the dollar China is one that I'm going to keep an eye on. I think. There is very little reason to buy Chinese uh, yuan right now. Also, don't forget we have the um, on the 27th, I think it is, we have the uh, RRR cut uh, uh, kicking in. So, if there's anything positive on the dollar China, I think we can have a test uh, move back through this triangle and go go for a test of 692 and a half, 693. If in turn we get a very bearish dollar scenario. Uh, then we can't rule out uh, a test, a retest of the 684, 85 again. But um, what I did this morning, because of my disappointment on on, on those meetings, um, was buy a little bit of Euro China. Um, I don't, I haven't charted it. I just did it because of a feeling. So I bought a few euros and I bought a few uh, dollar China. So I'm, I'm rather long Euro China for the time being, uh, expressing this this relatively. Um, negative bias uh, that I have on the on the CNH. Um, we got to look, have take a look at energy as well. So let's first go back onto the onto the daily. So as people know, I've been uh, commenting on this. To me, this 62, 67 zone is historically been a, a bit of a a heavy traffic zone and, and, and what I would call uh, equilibrium zone because we've seen um, how it collapsed through in uh, 2020 and then when it was positive, when the uh, uh, central banks were injecting money, where the economies were, were crawling back out, look, we, we, we also traded a lot in this 62, 67 area on, uh, on um, uh, WTI. So to me, this is a bit of an equilibrium zone. It would be really looking panicky if we start to break below and uh, especially below this additional trend line that I have in the 61s. Um, and then if you look on at it on the shorter term frame, the wedge or whatever we came we came out of here, the uh, the tar the possible target is also in the in that 61 zone. Not saying that it has to reach uh, this target. I, I really for the time being don't really know what's going to happen to to oil. But if it goes down there, um, I think I'm going to be starting to put on my butcher's glove and uh, catch knives. Um, on the top side, I think we have to uh, look out for what's happening between 70 and 70, 70 here in the short term, uh, more medium term. I think uh, if we get a move back up to this 73 and a half, 74 area, that's going to be a, quite a big zone. That for oil. Um, Gold has been asked. I know uh, Ryan already took a, a, a peek at it, but uh, to me, we're on a bit of a crossroad here and we're hanging just around there. Uh, I think 1960, 19, low, 19 and a quarter, that's going to be the, the range to observe uh, in gold. If we see a dovish enough dover, dollar meeting tonight, this uh, could easily break back uh, through 1960. If in turn, Powell succeeds to uh, put a bid under the dollar, um uh, this 19 and a quarter has to be uh has to be monitored in my opinion silver less less clear we're we're hovering around we we could argue that this is a bit of a of a bullish flag right uh for those uh watching those things um so yeah um and that would go in the underside would coincide with uh Support coming in here around the low 22s. And the top side, anything back through 22, call it 55, 60 or so, and then need a confirmation above uh, 22. That's where it needs to to get through, to, to gain traction again, to, to be able to go up somewhere into the, the 23 bucks. Um, have I, uh, have I covered? Anything else? Does anyone want to look at anything else um, while we're on it? While I'm on it, still we got. I think uh, you've done. I think you've done a splendid job, as always. Yeah. Then I give it back to you. Um, 
no problem. Oh, uh, not gas. Uh, oh, yeah, you're you're a nookie. You're right, Catherine. You're a nookie. Tomorrow we'll we'll have um, we'll have the Norgus Bank, right? Just uh, before we we even do the show. Um, look, this has been in a very very powerful uh, uh, up channel, right? Uh, since uh, since December. But it's also been responsive to what's happening in uh, in, in Brent uh, right now. So with, with all trading higher, we have found a top. So I think you have to really be careful what's happening around uh, closer to 11.50. And um, yesterday, this is the initial little support where we bounced off yesterday. So keep an eye on 11.30. Um, but I think more importantly is going to be this one here, and that's uh, 11.20. And then we are talking about... 11, 15, so 11, 15, 20. That's where we should find support with a level of last resort for this run around 11, 10. So you have like 1% here where it should be important tomorrow to, to monitor what's uh, happening in the um, in the Euro Noki coming out of the Norgas Bank. Um, let me have a quick uh, peek. Are they scheduled to, um, yeah, they are scheduled to raise 25 BPs, right? Yeah, it, it, it's also possible because with the weakening of the Norwegian kroner, it gives a, it gives an easier easier uh, reason to hike, right, uh, for the Norges Bank. So I guess they will uh, remain on the path that they have um, that they have uh, um, signaled as well uh, last time. Um, dollar Norway still well still looking a bit because of the weakness of the Norway. <laughs> but keep an eye out if tomorrow. Uh, we start to get back through 11.21 and then uh, call it low. Uh, oh, no, that's still the Euro Norway, sorry. Um, on the dollar Norway. Um, now, the dollar Norway is a, is a bit of a different one. On the, on the dollar Norway, we, we also had this upward channel, but looks a bit weaker because of the, because of the dollar coming off, right? So this one is one that you need to pay attention to tonight, I would say, around 11, around 10, 60, 65, probably. And then you're looking at um, at a bit higher here. And actually, on the daily, we might be making, uh, if we get back up to 10.73 or so, 75, you might be in a bit of a head and shoulder here. Um, that remains to be seen. Um, and on the downside for tomorrow, I think your bigger zone is going to be around 10.30s down to 10.20s. Um, but um, yeah, um, then about uh, the Norwegian kroner, Cathy, I hope uh, that uh, helped you. And with that, back to you, uh, Mr. Ryan. Thank you very much, Mr. K. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my overriding thought, as said, for the Fed tonight is um, any dollar strength probably not going to last very long. Um, that's what I'm going to be focusing on tonight, seeing if if that happens. Um, what I want to share quickly is that uh, if you're looking for somewhere to be, can you see my screen okay? Yes, sir. If you're looking for somewhere to be and, uh, you know, come and join a community where we're going to be going over everything that happens tonight, um, come and join us in the Forex Analytics platform there. If you use code FFL20, which I'll put in there as well, you get 20% off for as long as you hold a subscription for that. And also don't forget to check out our Traders Funding Program um, where you can leverage up your account uh, for minimum risk, i.e. just the assessment fee. Um, let's get the right link, shall we? I've blown it. Um, so you can check that out as well. As I say, um, you know, for the price of the assessment, you can have a an account up to a million dollars um, and your risk is only the assessment fee. Um, so you don't uh, not put in your own money to risk there. You put in our money to risk um, and you will receive 75 percent of everything you make. Um, so not a bad deal there all around. Very good for traders in America because you can get around the FIFO rules. Um, by using this account, or you can do a slice and dice strategy we like to employ. Um, so check that out there. Link is in the chat function there. And on that note, I do wish you all many pips. Uh, RA, yes, it is MT4 and MT5. Um, so you have a choice. Um, any questions you have at all, um, you can see on the screen there, there's a little button. 
Um, all you have to do is click that and you can have a chat with the wonderful people in the back end there. Any questions you have, you can put it there or speak to us as well. Um, we're happy to take your questions on that. So yeah, I wish you all the best of luck tonight with the FOMC. If in doubt, stay out, pick up the pieces after, um, make loads of pips. I wanna hear some good stories tomorrow. Thank you as always to Kay and Stell for their valued input. And uh, we shall see you all tomorrow for the aftermath, the after party. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Ryan. Cheers, guys. And uh, see you Thanks, at the chat room. Yeah, see you guys.